He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. How's he doing? Yeah, so pretty, pretty simple stuff. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Um, we're doing back-to-back -back recordings today because we can, although these are going to land a couple, uh, probably a week apart. Um, we've got Dr. Tony Hampton, who I am, I, I can say without fear of being contradicted, you have by far the most organized how to get a hold of me <laughs> set up of any of our guests in two years. Thank you. <laughs> and and th that's basically a teaser to make folks listen to the end of the show. To find out how to get a hold of Dr. Hampton, hang around to the end and we'll tell you. That's right. That's Phil, right. Phil, why have we got Dr. Tony Hampton with us today? Well, um, we have Dr. Tony Hampton because he is just an all around great guy. And, um, you know, not only his uh, organizational uh, skills for his website would make you question whether he's actually a doctor, but I think his whole approach uh, to medicine and his laid back uh, style um, you know, uh, kind of uh, raises alarms in uh, in in certain circles because most doctors just aren't like Tony. Um, I was uh, fortunate to, uh, I think, first uh, interact with Tony probably about two years ago, and uh, real lucky uh, a few months ago to be able to spend some time uh, with him on the set of the uh, Carnivore documentary series that's going to be coming out shortly. And uh, really been looking forward to uh, having this conversation with him. Uh, so with that, uh, Tony, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, I feel the same way uh, getting a chance to interact with you and the rest of the Reverse Carnivore crew uh, was very inspiring, uh, particularly since I, I kind of started my journey uh, as many of us, you know, having some issues with my stomach, my wife having to deal with diabetes. And what I found is that, uh, you know, diet was the key. So I kind of went from this, you know, a vegetarian plant-based model where I felt better, uh, but I still suffer from, you know, irritated stomach, uh, bloating. Uh, I would still have flares of irritable bowel. And then I, I just needed something better. I, I would use probiotics. The probiotics actually made things much better as well. But then if I'd stopped the probiotics, here it comes. So, so for me, it was like, let me look at something different. I kind of fell into the low carb space. And I, and I noticed that as I took more and more plants away, I felt better and better. So I kind of went low carb then I kind of eased into keto I'm kind of in the carnivore, you know, kind of ketovore, like, and then, but most days carnivore, because I find that with that dietary pattern, I have no worries at all about my stomach flaring up. So if I want to live in harmony with the world, I minimize plants uh, totally, oh, uh, you know, there are some things I tolerate and I will do those things if my wife's looking funny at me because she prepared it, right? But for the most part, <laughs> we have an understanding that, uh, I do better with animals. And, and, and since I've been introducing my patients to this model, I've kind of shifted from a doctor who primarily was, you know, trying to meet my HEDIS goals, which is dealing with, you know, quality of care. And I was trying to, you know, make sure everybody was on a stat and make sure everybody was uh, getting their diabetic eye exam, making sure everybody's A1C was uh, being managed with medicines to a model where I'm trying to convince patients to take a different path, which is we'll bridge the medicine. We'll use the medicine as bridge therapy. And for most patients, particularly a type two diabetic, as an example, they have a path to uh, getting off medicine. I saw a patient just literally a few hours ago, and he was like, nobody ever told me that diabetes type two was reversible. Nobody ever told me that I would not be on medicines for the rest of my life. And, and, and if, we can't live in a world where that's true. We can't live in a world where patients are not giving a path to heal. And so mm -hmm. for me, and I'm sure for you, Dr. Avedia, 
it's like it changes everything. So when I come to the clinic, they're like, you know, they look at you as a healer. And that's something that uh, I'm not sure they really did pr prior to this approach. So it's been great. And I, I can't go back to the old model that I had before I started doing this. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's uh, most uh, inspiring uh, about what you're doing and what's unique about what you're doing is, you know, uh, the community you're doing it in and uh, the types of patients that you have. Uh, so talk a little bit uh, about that because, and I'll preface this by saying, you know, one of the criticisms that you often hear about carnivore diets, uh, you know, and maybe even low carb diets in general is that they're, you know, they're hard to do, um, they're expensive, you need to have, you know, access to all sorts of, uh, you know, things that the average person can't get, can't do uh, to do these uh, approaches. Yeah, well, the first thing is, um, when you eat the standard American diet, um, because you're not eating a lot of healthy proteins and fats, you may actually be hungry. And so you're going to be more prone to snack in that setting. So if you're snacking, you have to, well, what does it cost to snack all the time, right? So you have to start thinking about that. The other thing I think about in this community I serve, and I'm on the south side of Chicago, predominantly African-American population, though is absolutely diverse uh, beyond that. What happens is in that population, yes, people are thinking about costs, but what I tell people is it does not have to be organic, grass-fed, pasture-raised, you know, blessed by the man above. It doesn't have to be all of those things. All it needs to be is, uh, you know, ground beef or, uh, I remember when I first started my journey, I wasn't a big fan of chicken thighs, but you need a little fat, and I find that the thighs are juicier and all of a sudden, I prefer that thighs any day over like a breast, for example. So, so what I do is I, I remind them that when you eat this way, the hunger tends to go away. So what happens is you may have been eating breakfast previously. Now you're just kind of doing brunch and, and dinner. You're doing intermittent fasting. So now you've, you've eliminated an entire uh, uh, meal. And then they are then given an example of what that can look like. And um, for example, you know, I know eggs are not cheap anymore, but but it's a carton of eggs. So what does it cost to get a carton of eggs? Um, sometimes even uh, lunch, because I tend to, you know, eat animals for lunch, you know, what does it cost to go to Sam's and get a uh, chicken that was a rot rotisserie chicken. It's like, I, who knows how they raise the chickens? That's another subject for another day, but it's $4.99. Now for me, I may eat a half a chicken, but for a lot of my patients, they'll eat a third of a chicken. So you got for five bucks, you got chicken for lunch, right? So, so I think it's all about holding their hand and coaching them and saying to them, there is a way to do this. You're going to eliminate those costly processed foods. No, you do not have to be you don't have to buy any keto anything. Uh, that's a, you know, buy real food that's on the outside of the grocery store. And what you'll find if you're willing to prepare some food and eat leftovers, it's not going to cost you a lot of money. I find that it's cheaper. I would spend, and it costs more now, but I would, you know, go to Subway, get a sandwich, uh, some chips and even a soda back in the day. And, and I see my team members doing that now at clinic. And, they'll, and these are people who make, a you know, maybe a tenth of what I make as a doctor. And they're constantly running to the fast food, spending money. And, and then they're like sleeping right after they ate it because it, you know, knocks you out. But what I tell people is keep it simple, be prepared to prepare food. And when you do it smartly, it's actually cheaper. So, and in the communities of color, you have, you know, a very high number of poor metabolic health. And so if you think about the 7% who are, who are metabolically healthy and 93% aren't metabolically healthy, that percentage is going to be way higher. There's way more people of color who are not metabolically healthy. So, so we have a little bit of an obligation to uh, save the system money, to save the patient money by healing them, and then they won't have to spend a lot of money on medicines and, and procedures and surgeries. And of course, we save money on food if we just tweak it and show them how to do it the right way. 
that's kind of a mic drop. Do you think so? <laughs> okay. What 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 more do we need to say? It doesn't cost more. It takes less time. It helps you uh, recover from the diseases that have been considered chronic. It saves you from all kinds of problems in the future that are we can pretty well guarantee you're going to have based on your current situation. What's not to love? Well, if you think about, I just had a conversation with my endocrinologist and I was kind of having a conversation about the medicines like Jardius that essentially make you urinate out the uh, glucose, right? And I was, and the issue with those medicines is that they increase the risk for, uh, you know, a, what they call a euglycemic metabolic acidosis. Um, and, and that means your blood sugar can be normal, but you just have this acidotic state, particularly if you're on keto, right? So, and I have all these patients on keto and low carb. So I'm saying to her, well, this is what I'm learning in my training on low carb. I should be cautious. Should how do you feel about it? But but the point of me bringing it up is to say you look up that medicine and it probably costs you know three four hundred bucks a month if not five hundred right, and it may only reduce your A one C by a point if that right. So in what universe does it make sense to say to somebody instead of instead of focusing on not eating the foods that turn into glucose. We're going to just give you a medicine so you can pee it out. That's not a, that doesn't make sense. And we're going to charge you $500 a month for it. And it's only going to reduce your A1C by a point. So we have to completely shift the paradigm to one where let's avoid the poison. Let's <laughs> use, yes, that would be more. There's simple. an idea. Yes. Let's not ingest and, the poison. <laughs> and then what we do is we, we, if we use antidotes like that medicine, We'll use it as bridge therapy until you adopt the lifestyle changes that we are attempting to adopt. Because it does take time. Life happens. Give people grace. You know, it takes time. But once you adopt these lifestyle choices, there's no need for the Jardius. And the irony is that we love these medicines that they come up with that don't increase insulin, rather it's Ozempic or Jardius or any medicine out there, including metformin. And they're like, man, I wonder why these medicines don't increase the risk for heart attack and stroke. Well, any medicine that treats diabetes that doesn't cause hyperinsulinemia is going to do that. So this is not rocket science. This is like, duh. But but why are we putting all of this money into these medicines when we can simply avoid the poison? So again, if we can uh, help our doctors understand this simple concept, we would, again, save money, avoid side effects like getting a UTI because you keep urinating out glucose and we can and then we can guide patients towards a better model the thing that people will assume well doc they're not going to do the lifestyle change i say yes they will i i see it over and over again because they have been giving bad advice so if you give me advice in the past that says it's okay to eat uh, 45 carbs per meal as a diabetic then of course i'm gonna not be successful because you're giving me the poison. How about if we eat an egg omelet instead, instead of eating the, the grits and the oatmeal and the toast and the, and the bread and all of that stuff. So I think it's the poor advice that has led to failures. And it's also uh, clinicians not really understanding the value of nutrition. They are not trained to think that way. And our job is to provide a, a, a path for them as we continue to educate them that there is another way that's way more effective and as you have suggested cheaper and uh and people will do it because nobody's really looking to be sick they just need a a way to heal and you really don't heal with medications medications are like the like i saw that recent episode with the guy who created his own you know company no insurance needed we're going to do it as a a group. Well, there's another way to do this. And I just think that the doctors are oblivious to it. And I don't think they read, we read nutrition studies, like as our hobby, they read studies that are based on medicine as their hobby. And so that, so there's a disconnect. And I think we need to work on that. Well, you were trained in the traditional model. And yes. And, and I so, think, so how, what would, what, what would, you know, Something happens, you're become the the uh, 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 surgeon general of the United States. What what's what what do you say yeah. to the American people and specifically the American medical community now as the America's top doc? What do you do? 
Well, uh, yeah, I'll sign up for that job any day. And what I would say is we have to shift the paradigm. And I would start with, and I think me and my colleague, Dr. Avedia, both agree that we didn't get a lot of nutrition education in our training. So the first thing I would do is not just make nutrition training, which is not required, I don't think. I think my understanding is that it's recommended that you get 24 hours of nutrition education, right? And that means some people get it, some don't. The, so, so my nutrition education won't be this parental nutrition where we learn how to put food in your vein if you're not able to feed yourself. It'll shift to if a person's in front of you and you need to advise them instead of just training me how to click the nutrition referral button. And we do want to keep those professionals involved to kind of help coach our patients. Teach the clinician how to get people started on basic nutritional information. And so I would start with that. I would also uh, train our doctors to meet the patient where they are. I may be a carnivore. I may have a, a vegan in front of me. And, and because we all are different, can I then advise that vegan in a way that honors their belief systems? I think one of the most important things we need to think about is research. And most doctors are busy. Literally, I'm running home to make time for you guys was just seeing patients and, and we're busy. So I need to have clinicians trained to look at research studies in a way that is going to add value. So if a clinician can't distinguish between an observational study that shows association correlation versus a randomized controlled trial, which is what we rely on as causation, then we're going to continue to say eggs are bad one week and eggs are good the next week. And, and so, and in fact, I'm not even sure why we keep doing uh, studies that are observational if we already have studies that were randomized controlled trials. So what are we doing? So we keep confusing people, confusing doctors and the people who advise the patient. So I really worry about that. And the last thing I would think about is training our clinicians to, and I learned this from my, when I got a master's in nutrition and functional medicine, I learned about how we are really uh, focused on diagnosing diseases based on an organ system. So instead of doing this organ system diagnosis, we need to help people understand, understand that everything's interconnected. And, and you should always ask yourself, we should never say to a patient, we're, you know, we've done all the tests, we don't know what's wrong with you. We should never, we should always, there's something wrong with them because they're not healthy. So our job is to retrain clinicians and or partner with like functional medicine clinicians or docs, you know, integrative docs who have a different scope, who can see things differently. And if I were to use an example, so if I'm a regular doc, patient comes in and they're anemic and they take iron, and we think it's because of uh, blood loss. We've stopped the blood loss. They're anemic, so we're going to give them iron, and they're still not getting better. Is there? Is it possible something else is not allowing them to get better? And, and, and what I learned in my functional medicine training is that maybe they need copper, you know, so maybe they're copper deficient, and you need copper to work with the iron to resolve the anemia. And these are little, and so you can give them all the iron they want, they are, they'll just remain anemic. And guess what that would cost the health system as we continue to transfuse them and, and kind of, well, they went to the GI doctor, they didn't see anything, and we kind of chase our tail when there's things that should be fairly obvious that we should be looking for. So, so, I, so I would really focus on the next generation of clinicians and I would uh, look to, and I would also reward uh, our uh, clinicians for keeping people healthy in a way that some of the other countries do. And I think that we do a poor job of, uh, if I think about my average diabetic, if a diabetic has diabetes with retinopathy or some eye issues or a diabetic with neuropathy or some nerve issues or some renal issues or nephropathy, I get paid more money to manage their diseases with those diagnoses, then I, but if I take that same patient and they were on insulin, they get off of insulin, I take them off of their metformin and they're technically not diabetic anymore by the criteria, I make less money. That's a conundrum. Wow. Exactly. So I, why, I, why? I wish, I mean, Phil, there's your snippet. Holy smokes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think really that's one of the central problems is that we, um, 
we as doctors expect people to be sick. Quite honestly, we need them to be sick, you know, to help them. That's how we know how to help them. That's how we're educated to help them. And the concept that, you know, that like you talked about that patient that you saw earlier, uh, that you were the first one to say to them that you don't have to have type two diabetes for the rest mm. of your life. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I, I hear the same thing uh, often. Um, when you tell a patient that you don't actually have to be sick, you don't have to just manage this condition that you have. In many cases, we can reverse it. We can make it go away. Um, that's very empowering, very inspiring. And most of them are like, yeah, sign me up. I'll change what I eat. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and then, like you said, we can then give them advice that actually works. And, um, you know, everyone, uh, everyone benefits from it. Um, you know, you have taken the extra step. Well, you've taken lots of extra steps. You've already mentioned that you went and got functional medicine training and you got, you know, nutritional training. Um, but, you know, you are truly trying to change not only your patient community, uh, but the medical community around you. Uh, so talk about some of the things that you've been doing to try and influence uh, the healthcare system, you know, that you're part of. Yeah, it's, well, the first thing that I like about Advocate Health, which is, you know, in Illinois, Wisconsin, North South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, uh, is that they allow clinicians to be their kind of their independent clinician. So me being kind of a low carb keto carnivore diet does not conflict with them in a way that would make me nervous about my job. So the first thing I want to do is shout out to them for doing that. Uh, I, I would say, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years ago, we were having a conversation around us doing what we call the Toyota lean model, where we would uh, improve the processes within our system. Little things like, okay, you walk into the room, have the hand sanitizer by the door and not by the sink, right? Because you need to do your hands before you interact with the patient. In that journey, there was not clinician leadership. I was blessed to become the medical director for that. And during that journey, I was, you know, asked, what is it that you need to do to improve the health of the populations we serve? And for me, it was obvious lifestyle. So, so initially what we did, we, we created this healthy living program where in that program, we would partner with uh, other clinicians, other team members. It could be somebody from respiratory, physical therapy, nurses, docs, et cetera. And then we would get in front of a couple of hundred people and talk about nutrition we partnered with the uh, Chicago Food Depository, and we would also, okay, you take the cauliflower and you can do some fancy things with it. Before we started seeing cauliflower rice in the grocery stores, uh, we would, you know, share, you can turn your cauliflower into rice, and we did things like that. That then merged into our uh, COPD uh, program, which is now virtual, was in person before the pandemic diabetes prevention program. I would just spin it since I had some leadership roles to be kind of a lower carb version of those programs. Diabetes prevention programs exist throughout the country, but we did kind of a low carb version. And then we then kind of ended up doing a food pharmacy. So when people come to see us at the hospitals, we would have on a certain day of the week, an opportunity for them to get food that was, you know, provided by the Chicago Food Depository, but it would, but it came with, came with the caveat, we're going to also teach you about what to do with some of the foods that maybe you're not accustomed to and prepared in a way that would uh, suit your needs. So, and then, so, so we're doing those things. We have, you know, we're working on this uh, a smart farm where we're going to, we have some land and we're going to grow some food and that's going to then add to what the Chicago Food Depository is doing. Uh, we have uh, Advocate Aurora Enterprises and what Advocate Enterprises is going to do is say, we're going to take care of our, our women and, and young families. We're going to take care of our seniors. And the third bucket will be wellness. And in that bucket, we're going to create programs to support the wellness journey so what I'm trying to do within my health system 
is bring this you know crazy low carb metabolic health message to a large health system that's going to take some time but my hope is that if we're the sixth largest health system in a country then the impact would be substantial because it is true that there is some truth to what I said earlier about being paid for keeping people well. With Medicare Advantage, which is a lot of our patients, particularly on the South side, if we manage their care well, we're not refusing care to get their MRIs and CTs, but if they're healthier, then we have more resources for programs like this. So my goal is, uh, you know, we had this model before we merged with Atrium, which is the South part of our organization before it became Advocate Health again. And, and I'm saying to them, guys, help pe people live well. That's a nice message, but how do we define that? And what I try to do is help them define it as help people live well. It's not just making sure they're under statin. Helping them live well is to help them heal. So if we can help people heal, what would that say to the world about advocate health? What would the what would the perception be? It'd be like, you know, if you hang out with this organization, you won't just, you know, uh, get a great doctor who's going to try to take care of you. You're going to actually, you know, reverse chronic conditions that you thought were chronic. We should do chronic with quotes because people are getting off their blood pressure medicine. People who used to have polycystic ovarian syndrome don't have it anymore. People who are having problems with acne, they're not having their acne problem anymore. People with type 2 diabetes are uh, doing better. And guess what? Type 1 diabetics who historically never saw A1Cs in the 5 range can see A1Cs in the 5 range because they. if you follow that model that Dr. Bernstein has set out uh, for us with the book, Di you know, uh, Diabetes Solution, or doctor, uh, uh, there's another doctor who's a nephrologist whose name will lose me right now. I think of in a moment. But if you take that model where you use lifestyle and medicine for a type one diabetic, you can now get your blood sugars in a in a normal range. And and it, and that was un, that was impossible because of hypoglycemia. But so now we have a path to help people who uh, otherwise would never get the type of numbers necessary to prevent chronic disease. And what people have to understand is that if you have a blood sugar, as an example, in the seven range for an A1C, right? And it stays there, you're still going to get all these chronic medical conditions. You, you have to put it, why would it be normal for a diabetic to have an abnormal A1C, which is, you know, averaging 150 from a glucose perspective, which is like a seven- and it's not normal for a person like me who's not diabetic. If you continue to have that inflammation, so that's another example of how we can retrain our, uh, retrain our clinicians to think that normal is normal, abnormal is not normal. And I think that that's what I've learned is that it's possible to be normal if you have lifestyle added to the, in most cases, temporary medicine. And for a type one, better control you're not going up and down. You're just kind of doing a narrow range for your blood sugar. And that's and, and then in your life, your quality of life, it, it shoots through the roof because hypoglycemia impacts more than just your blood sugar. It impacts your relationships. It impacts how you feel. It impacts your confidence. It impacts your ability to do things that you otherwise you wouldn't have done because you're afraid that I'm going to go to something and have a low sugar. So it just, so we can get our lives back but it takes lifestyle to make that happen. Nest and rope. Now, in my mind, that's something a bird lives in and something you hang <laughs> orders with. But I'm guessing there's more to it. Talk to us about nest and rope. Well, um, I, I am a fan of acronyms. So I, I just had to come up with a way to uh, have a person in front of me and address the things that may or may not lead to their success or, you know, failure. So when, when I did my functional medicine training, they have this functional medicine tree and the functional medicine tree is the roots of it are the things that lead to chronic illness, right? So, if, but, but in order to protect those roots, you have to do certain things. So we've already talked about nutrition. I would throw intermittent fasting in, and that's the end. And then you have to think about movement. And I always tell my patients, 
you can't leave your car in the garage. You, you have to take the car out of the garage. That's movement. And you need to put the right fuel in it. That's nutrition. And if you don't do those two things, it shouldn't surprise you that your legs were weak, which led to that fall, which led to your hip fracture or you hitting yourself on the head leading to a bleed. So, so, so you need to think about those things. The obvious things that the S represents are stress and sleep. When you don't get enough sleep, when you're under stress, your cortisol level is high, that's going to then ask your liver to release some glucose. So now you have a person who's under stress, not getting enough sleep, no surprise that they're having issues with their blood sugar the next day. Um, and then the T is for uh, we have a trauma recovery center within Advocate Health. So for people who have suffered trauma, they need to have an opportunity to recover from that because they're not going to do low carb or any of this other dietary or lifestyle interventions if they're not dealing with that. Your T is also for how you think. And I and I, what I try to do is live a life of purpose. So if I'm thinking and my thoughts are not self-limiting, it's more likely I'll be able to uh, you know, do the lifestyle that the doctor is recommending. If I'm, if my thoughts are right and I'm focused on my purpose, then when I, even when I do a podcast, I don't, it's no stress because I'm living my life purpose. My purpose is to teach the world about metabolic health. So I'm not as worried about how I say things. And, you know, I, I just focus on, am I living my purpose right now in order to live my purpose, the rope talks about they are for relationships. So I need to have a partner who is adding value. And what I mean by that is we're working in partnership to uh, achieve a similar goal. Now, it doesn't have to be just that spouse or uh, that type of partner. It can be the community that I'm um, in. I need to be in a community that serves me. One of the things I love about Dr. Avedia and the low-carb keto community is we have like a community that supports each other. So when everybody else thinks we're nuts, we can at least, you know, touch base with each other and say, well, he must be nuts too, because we're all <laughs> doing the same thing. <laughs> so, so that's what that is. And then the O and the um, P, uh, organisms and pollutants, those are about, and this is functional medicine thinking, I need to uh, have uh, I need to avoid things that harm me like toxins and pollutants. And that could be the sugar or it could be, you know, the plastic, right? And then I need to have a, a, a organisms in my gut that are serving me. Now, the good thing about what I love about the need for research in carnivore is that, you're, well, don't you need your microbiome? Is that going to disrupt it? And the reality is people need to understand with different dietary patterns, you have different needs in terms of your microbiome. So one of the most obvious is that the ketones, the fats that the beta butyrates and things like that, that we think about from a keto perspective, that helps protect your GI lining. So, so do I need to take a probiotic if I'm carnivore or keto? Probably not because I'm going to get it from my diet. So so, so, but you'll have people that are argue, oh, your microbiome, well, my microbiome feels great now that I'm eating this way. So I think it's about being nuanced and understanding that the microbiome will be different from a, for a carnivore versus a plant-based person. And then the, the rest of the uh, rope is the E for our emotions and uh, our life experiences. And we just want to make sure the things that we do serve us, that's our life experiences. And then we want to make sure we protect our emotions because if our emotions are not good, if we're sad, depressed, and anxious, and we're not addressing those things, then we're not going to be able to add uh, the value to our lives because we're distracted by that. So I really, so I want to, so when I see a person in front of me and they're, um, they're interested in changing their lives, maybe they found me and they're like, uh, you're the guy that's going to help me. I always have to make sure there's no like blind spots or gaps in those other areas. If you don't think about those other areas, you'll look at people and say they're not motivated or oh, they're not ready to change. You're using this as a diagnostic template. Is it's not? Oh, yeah. I use it to literally. If you don't, you have to be a problem solver as a clinician. And then what you do is when you find those gaps and you're like this, you know, they'll say this stuff never worked for me before, but they didn't, they never addressed that trauma they had, right? It could be a trauma because they got physically abused as an adult or a child. Until they address that, they may not be successful. And luckily within my health system, we have tools 
we literally have an embedded uh, intake person who will uh, reach out to a patient within a day or two if they are struggling, like emotionally, if, they, if they're depressed or anxious. And, and, and getting a behavioral health professional is very difficult. So it used to take three to four months. So what happens is they'll reach them within a couple of days, and then they'll be talking to a therapist within one to two weeks, which is really unheard of. And so now we can start to heal in that regard, or maybe it's just getting some tools. When you struggle, what do you do in those moments? And what my, my therapist team would do is say, here are some tools when you're struggling. I think everybody should have a coach personally. And we just literally within the past week have a program now where we have access to coaches. And anybody who does this work in terms of lifestyle knows that the coaches may be the most important piece. Even the research that Dr. Tro and his team did uh, recently, uh, getting people, you know, working with an industrial company and saving $4,000 per year uh, by doing low carb and reducing the cost of care, getting people off medicines. The research that Verda Health does uh, by the same methodology around low carb. In all of those models, even Dr. Eric Westman and Adaptive Life, they all have coaching. So if you don't have coaching, you will be successful with a portion but there'll be a large part of that group who will struggle because you're asking them to turn the ship away from the iceberg and they've been used to going towards the iceberg their whole life. But if you got coaching involved, that'll, that'll, that'll increase the probability of success. And I'm really excited that my organization's doing that. And I'm also just hoping that other clinicians who think there's something wrong with the patient or with them understand that we need a team to make this work. Wow. Um, I, I, <laughs> I want to follow up with this idea of, of tracking where folks are going, but I'm, I'm watching you, Phil. I, I don't want to stomp on something here. No, good. Go ahead. Okay. So you've got somebody who comes into your, uh, into your office, they're a physical, mental, emotional mess, and you're able to set them on this path. So what are you looking for as their what what are the signposts? How do you measure their progress, their success? I mean, if they're if they're grossly overweight and they start lo losing weight, obviously that's a that's a signpost. But I, I'm betting there's right. more. What are you looking for? Well, I think part of it is um, you know it's almost like um, when somebody walks into a room, the first thing I measure is. When I walk into that room, what is what do I feel in the air, right? Now, so that's the first thing. And I can tell when I walk in a room if a person is doing better. Number two, we we have a we have our, our medical assistants and our teams work together to do like our, you know, uh, you know, it's called PHQ9. So we have a, a questionnaire that helps to measure. Um, how are they doing uh, in terms of their mood? And we want to see their, we want to see an improvement in their scores, right? So if they, if we start to see improvements in their score, that's another way that we measure success. Now, the other parts are, you know, more metabolic health related. So if I, so if they're emotionally doing better, their scores are getting better, I feel that positive uh, vibe in the room. I always measure their health, my measures of metabolic health. So I'm always interested in, are they becoming more metabolically healthy? Because the thing that's valuable about, I mean, if you think about the study that Dr. Eric Westman, Dr. Georgia E recently done, where they use keto for refractory men mental illness, and it showed like 100% of the symptoms got better with this model. It showed that like 40 something percent or so of the patients left the hospital, rather it was schizophrenia, bipolar, depression with remission. Now, I don't know how a diet puts schizophrenia, bipolar, or depression to remission in hospitalized patients, but that's what the studies show, which is astounding. 96% uh, lost weight, et cetera. So, so I guess what I'm getting at is if I start to see things that I measure looking better, 
and 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 they're doing better then all of a sudden I'm, and i can share that information with them by the way miss jones your triglycerides are going down by the way uh mr jones your uh your hdl is going up oh look at that fasting insulin is going down oh look at you know look at your particle size for your ldl they're looking better so what i'll do is and then i'll share that because part of the success we have in the clinic is to celebrate we notice and we celebrate success we're comfortable with incremental change but we notice and celebrate success so and then it feeds on itself they come in i mean one of the things that i uh need to get back to doing i had stopped about six or seven months ago is i would give them a happy face sticker right and you're like what what is a a 70 year old going to do with a happy face sticker but they will when when i was doing that <laughs> they literally would like if you didn't give them the sticker and it had success there would be a problem you, you they wanted their sticker and, where's and my you, sticker yeah but <laughs> So I've been, I've been working for two months and I was here. <laughs> I was coming for the sticker. The, and, and, and I'm sure Dr. Ovedia sees this. When you walk through the door, they're so excited to celebrate their success. And rather it's an A1C that's gone down. Rather it's my relationship is better. Thanks for the referral. The, the therapist was wonderful. You know, they are just the, the weight loss. They're just like, doc, you didn't say anything about my weight loss. So <laughs> and then as a clinician, you walk out of that room feeling like you did something. You're not walking out of the room because you added that extra medicine. You're walking out of the room because you are you had to learn how to de-prescribe. And, and many times I kind of coach my patients and say, listen, you don't have to call me to stop metformin. If your blood sugars are running low because you're doing this diet, stop the metformin. You know, we have a conversation in advance about be prepared to do this because this is about to happen. I tell them to take pictures. Take a picture now before and after because you're going to get skinnier. The worst thing I can tell you is that you're about to be broke because you're going to need to buy some more clothes. And it's going to happen. If you struggle, we give you grace. But we also are comfortable saying to them that, listen, we're going to celebrate your success and we're not doing it because we, we like you skinnier. We're doing it because you told me about that granddaughter that you are going to visit and you want to have the energy to take the trip. You want to be able to get down on the ground if you need to. And we're going to focus on the bigger things. And, and I, I remember um, I remember when I was talking to Coach Bronson, who's also in the a carnivore community was part of a reverse carnivore. And, and that's what he kind of gave a good example. He was like, listen, you know, why do we need fitness in our lives? And he, it's not for what you think. It's because we want to be fit enough to do the basic things in life. So if I can go to the mall, hang out with the, you know, the group from church, uh, if, and for me, go take a hike, right? And I feel like taking a hike. I want to be able to do those things. And so for me, it's all about having a body that allow me to live my best life. And the only way you're going to do that is to take that body out of the garage, put the right gas in it, and then do those other things that the nest and rope speak of. And if we do that, and we train our next generation to think that way, they will find an easier path to help their patients. And it's been like, I, I sometimes I'm still not sure why there's not this this floodgate of clinicians like myself, like Dr. Avadia, who are haven't gotten the memo yet. We're, yeah. I mean, I respect Dr. Avadia, but you know, we're not that smart. We're just guys who went to school, got a good education. <laughs> we're not that, but but it seems like there's a disconnect which still perplexes me. Yeah, uh, you know, so, uh, and that's what, talk about how this has changed, you know, your career, your approach to going to work every day. Yeah, I had to learn, to be honest, which I had to learn to um, not get too excited. Because when you learn that you can help people heal with lifestyle, you want to help everybody heal with lifestyle. So the first thing I learned is that I had to learn to take it down a notch. There would be people in front of me who would be like so motivated that 
you're saying things and they're they're ordering stuff and downloading stuff as you talk because they were so motivated. And then you have the other people that just sit there and shake their head. And then you see them the next appointment and they're like, um, they it's like they they didn't hear anything you had to say, mm-hmm. right? And so I had to learn to not get frustrated because I found myself, particularly for those who have like uh, borderline kidney function, uh, let's just say they're, you know, we measure creatinines and microalbumins. Let's just say they're microalbumins 1500 and their creatinines 2.3. And they're all moving towards progressing in kidney disease. I know based on the research of uh, Dr. Uh, Unwin and his wife, Jen Unwin, David Unwin and Jen Unwin in UK, that, you know, they've done studies that show you can reverse kidney uh, disease just by simply changing your diet. Um, they and and so what happens is they are and this is a funny thing. This is what we struggle with. They will see a nephrologist who will say to them, "You can't do that. You can't do keto. It's not going to improve your kidney function." And I will so I give all of my patients in that I'll say, "Here's the study. If someone asks you or questions what we're doing, here's the study, and you're just asking for their support." while you try this, at least for six months to nine months or so. So so part of the struggle is if that person is not motivated to do that, then I have to honor that. Like I have to be okay that everybody's not going to do it. Or, and maybe those, that nest and rope thing I looked for, maybe there's nothing there that allowed me to help them. So having said that, I've gotten so much better at coaching people. And I do use the uh, motivational interviewing principles that we sometimes learn. So I do kind of, you know, look at their, you know, are they motivated yet? Where are they at in their journey? And I, I will tweak my message to fit where they are. But at the end of the day, I have, through the process of being comfortable with meeting people where they are, having tools like motivational interviewing. And obviously the biggest tool is we know what to do with people when they struggle. And I found a way to integrate all of that so that the the, the number of patients I can help has been exponentially greater than it was when I started my journey. And so seeing success has become the norm. Mm. And I just tend to identify why people struggle better than I did. And I think that's partly my own experience getting better, knowing what, you know, when you get a stall or something, what's going on with the weight, just knowing what's out there. Uh, I was just, you know, there was this, uh, this is unrelated, but I, there was this uh, inspire sleep thing that they have now where you can literally do an, you know, implant people who have sleep apnea and you put the implant in it'll kind of it's like a pacemaker for your breathing so it'll open their airway I hadn't even heard of that until recently but my point is as you have conversations as you do your research you open up this this wealth of information even the functional medicine training going back to the copper example and all of a sudden in front of you is a patient who's very motivated because they're hearing things through a different lens and and because they're hearing it through a different lens, and it's about healing wellness, they're very motivated to take that journey with you. So so for me, I had to grow as a person. Uh, and then as I've grown, my patients have kind of come along with me. And I see, again, a lot of people, even today, I had a patient with schizophrenia and bipolar, who I hadn't seen for a while, it's been nine months, but since I saw them, even with those diagnoses, had lost 30 plus pounds. And although it didn't help their musculoskeletal complaints as much, uh, their mental state has dramatically improved. So even the people that you question have the capacity to do this, a lot of those folks are doing just fine. You just have to coach them. And when they struggle, give them grace. And that, and with that kind of a mindset, there's not a lot of tension. So if people come there and they're struggling, I'm like, you didn't expect to struggle? I mean, that's normal. So we're going to, I'm just here to kind of, Hit you on your bottom again and get started again. That's all I'm here for. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's been great, guys. I 
I don't know what to tell you other than um, I just hope more people find what I found. I hope more people are able to meet people where they are. And I, I never thought I'd be carnivore, but I'll be honest with you, um, it took the knowledge of knowing a few things that I would say surprised me. When you've been plant-based for eight years or so, and you are kind of into this whole blue zones thing, right? Yeah. And you're thinking, well, that's where they live the longest. So we got to do that. So rather it's Japan, Italy, uh, Greece. I love Greece. Uh, they do live seven to 10 years longer, although they actually do eat pork. They just don't talk about the fact that they eat pork. That's another subject. <laughs> but they probably deal with the deficiencies by doing that. But then you learn about like the Mormons who live 10 to seven to 10 years longer, but they eat meat, right? Just like the folk at, in Loma Linda, Seven Day Adventist. Then you learn about Hong Kong and they eat on average two steaks per person per day and they eat meat. So when I tell patients, listen. The Hong Konger, the Hong Kongese are my spirit animal. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Two steaks a day, that sounds right. That sounds about right. That, that's heaven for me. And I just meet those vegans where they are. I They, they, they respect the fact that I was a plant-based guy at one point. And we just talk about, that's not my ideal diet anymore. I don't like to take supplements, but if you want to do that, let's show you how to do it. Let's talk about the the vitamins that you may need. And, and most of us are aware of the B12. So, you know, say, doc, I'm good. I can, I can, uh, I don't, you know, I can get my B12 from my mushrooms and I can get my B12 from my nu nutritional yeast. And I say, you can, but you probably need more than that. So let's supplement that just to be safe. You know, let's make sure your vitamin D is okay. And we'll make sure that's okay. And then we'll make sure their vitamin A is okay. So what I do with those patients who want to do a different dietary pattern, I walk with them. I, they may need to take omega-3. Sure. So we just walk with them. We explain why we think they should do those things. And, and, and the reason why this is important, in fact, I'm thinking about making my topic for uh, this symposium for metabolic health in, in the realm of how vegans and carnivores can kind of coexist. Um, this is important because I was just talking to one of my uh, docs uh, with an Indian background uh, from India. And he said, you know, we, we worship cows. What, what am I going to do with that? Not, not an option for them. Right. Exactly. So we have cultural issues. We have religious issues. And, and obviously we have ethical issues that people have. My job is not to change any of those things, but to walk with people where they are and say, if that's where you are, here are some areas that you may become deficient in, and this is how we resolve that. And then we can kind of coexist and understand and respect each other. What we don't want is to live in a world where there is no mutual respect. Yeah. And that they can't see the world at all through the lens. Because my ethics is based, going back to that rope, my E, my life experiences are different than yours. So my interpretation of what's ethical to an animal may be different than yours based on my life experiences. Some of that's knowledge. Some of that's just, you know, what my mama taught me, right? And so can we then live in a world <laughs> where we mutually respect each other? where we both can agree to disagree, just like a marriage, but we still can live in harmony. And that if we live in a world like that with something, because it takes a little knowledge, right? So if I, if a, a vegan's never heard that Hong Kongers live, probably most years they are the top for longevity. If they've never heard that, then they're going to not know that that's a possibility. Yeah. So my job and our job is to put it out there and then pray that the people who hear the message are willing to open up their minds and receive it. And if we can live in a world like that, we won't have to fuss about carnivore versus vegan. It'll be, here are dietary options for everybody. Here's the pros and cons of each. You choose the one that your body receives the best. And for me, it just happens to be animal-based. Yeah, yeah. And I had to open my eyes to that first. If I had not, you, you know, once you put vegan in the, uh, in YouTube, all the rest of the videos are going to be vegan. 
So you get looped into that. Same for carnivore. So we have, and I tell people, what if the first video that popped up when you said wellness or trying to be healthy was carnivore? And that's what you, and you got looped and you saw Dr. Ovedia and, and you got looped into that. So that's how life is. It's a little bit random. And so we have to be honest about that and say, yeah, you're right. If I had a seen that first and, and YouTube decided to only send me Dr. Sean Baker and Dr. You know, Chafee and the rest of the crew, that's what it would have been. Yeah. So there are people listening to, we, I mean, thousands of people a week listen to this. Um, and I know that no matter how efficient and effective you are, you, you can't treat thousands of people a week. What are you doing to to replicate your way of of looking at the world, your way of treating patients, so that you, you've got a way that is very appealing? But how, how do you replicate yourself? What are you doing so that more people are able to to find a, a healthcare practitioner like you? I the first thing I do is to just be Tony. Right. So um, let me see. Oh, I have darker skin than yours. <laughs> so so by being myself, <laughs> I may attract some folk who may need that to feel comfortable. Yeah. Right. Like I know I haven't like the black carnivore, for example. So she kind of had she has this kind of niche. Right. So part of it is to just be yourself because you may bring a different kind of like presentation to the conversation to the next person. Um, the other part, and that, that means I got to be out there doing YouTube videos and podcasts, right? So beyond that, um, by the, my hope is that the, um, you know, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, so we have an outreach committee. And with the outreach committee, which I'm involved with, my goal is to think through what, do we need to do to get this message out? Part of it is have conferences and things like that, but that's kind of like gathering the the cult, the herd that's already yeah, in that. Preaching to the choir there. Preaching to the choir, right? So that's not as effective as what I just did last week. So one of the videos I just released was Advocate Health, How to Heal conversation now that's going to not a low carb community but the advocate community and i was able to lead a discussion that touched on metabolic health and how it's so beneficial so in those programs i mentioned through advocate health i'm hoping to help lead that be involved with those programs to help uh but 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 the other piece with the society of metabolic health practitioners is do we can we volunteer to teach, you know, be, be be at their conferences and or teach some of the curriculum that's going to be like the um, there's a new ketogenic textbook that's coming out. Uh, I think this month in April coming up, right? At least depending on when this is released. So if we can have uh, textbooks like that, and then we can have clinicians like myself, Dr. Ovedi, and others who can then say, you know what, I'll I'll be willing to go to the American Medical Association conference and teach uh, a lecture related to uh, metabolic health, kind of, or whatever. So I think the, the the goal is to be more mainstream. We already have the larger organizations endor endorsing low carb and keto, rather than American Diabetes, American Heart, uh, the S S Association of Clinical Endocrinology. So we have to bring it to mainstream, not to say this is the better way, but to say it should be a dietary option so that when people are facing their clinician who's like, don't do that, they can then say, well, it seems like it's endorsed by all the large organizations. You know, they're going to be talking about that at the American Medical Association Conference. So we have to make it more mainstream. And, and I think the, I call myself metabolic health doc because I felt that was more palatable as opposed to the carnivore doc, right? I mean, how dare Dr. Avedia have all that meat on his book cover? How dare he? You know, it's like every time I show you a book cover to patients, man, they're like, what? You know, so we want to we want to socialize this in a way that people can like 
start to digest it because you're going against conventional thinking. And then we want to do it in a way that says, man, I was thinking that way too. I had no clue that there was more nutrients mm -hmm. in a steak than, than in kale. The way I was trained, kale was God and the steak was risky. You can do it, but you need to be careful. Now it's completely flipped. And I think a lot of people are still in the kale space and they haven't been taught any of this. They haven't heard your podcast. So I think we need to just put put it out there and people will start to, uh, you know, hear the right message, be open, and they're going to honor the science for what it is. And that's why we have to teach people how to read these studies better. So, Wow. This is like, th th this is so cool, Phil. Our, our prior guest uh, was a, a layperson, not a, not a healthcare practitioner. And he and Phil are talking, basically, it, it, I don't think it was English. It didn't sound like English to me. Um, and I, I feel like I can understand you. I'm talking to a, I'm talking to a doctor who's out there healing people and I get it. So that's intentional wow. though. That's well, intentional. I appreciate it. Hey, yeah, I appreciate because I can't, it. when I wrote my book, fix your diet, fix your diabetes, I had to you no know, talk in a way that my mom could understand that my brother could understand. And yeah. I, I think that's necessary. We can, now, if I'm having a conversation with Dr. Jason Fong, we may go into the minutia a little bit, but for most people that will view um, my YouTube channel, you guys' YouTube channel or podcast, they they need, they. it's okay to go there, but it's also important to, you're going to meet people who you think know stuff and they just don't. So we got to keep it as simple as possible. And when we deviate from simple, we have to try to throw in a quick explanation. And that way people can, you won't lose people uh, because this is not complicated. I tell people, you know, if they're keto, eat all the meat you want and some non-starchy vegetables. We don't need a, we don't need a meal plan. You know, we, we can give you a meal plan, but just keep it simple. And, and when people say, that's it, I say, yeah. But they need to know that rice has a lot of carbs but they don't know that and they need to be given that information as well and then they can just kind of pick and choose how they do things so it's really important we keep things simple yeah well this would be a good time for you to just kind of uh tell folks uh where they can connect with you best now we're going to post your your incredibly organized link tree on our show notes, but there's probably one or two that are that are great places to to learn from Dr. Hampton better than yeah. others. So what are those? Yeah, I always like to start with the YouTube channel. So if if people search my name, Dr. Tony Hampton, in YouTube, I think that's important. Many of my patients struggle with the podcast theme just because of the nature of my patients. I have an 80 year old who is like, what's a you know. What is it? And I'll put it on their phone. And when I see them next time, they haven't listened to anything. It's just too much, right? Yep, yep. But for some reason, for some reason, YouTube is like the best place to, um, you know, to get people to connect. So I, I would just start there. For those who don't mind doing podcasts, I think that that's a great place to go because I think it'll definitely provide um, a great resource. Um and I think people who are starting their journey, they're borderline diabetic or diabetic, they can just go to Amazon and get the Fix Your Diet, Fix Your Diabetes text because I think that's helpful. One of the things on that link tree is my handout. So I have a handout that says on one side, eat this. On the opposite side, don't eat that. You know, I downloaded it. Yes. Yeah, so it's very simple and straightforward. And then, of course, I think the video I ask people to watch to get started is how to adopt a low-carb diet. I think that's a great video that's on that link tree. And if they're trying to do carnivore, I had a great uh, interview with A. Day Fox, the Black Carnivore, and that's a link, you know, how to get started on carnivore that I did with her. And I think those are just foundational. And then, and one more thing, somebody else's channel, that's on my link tree is the beat diabetes guy. Uh, his name is Dennis Pollack. He's a pastor and he has some uh, foundational videos that I think a diabetic should check out because they need to know that a Hershey's bar 
it's going to raise your sugar less than a banana. Like nobody knows that. So wow. Dennis does a good job of saying, here's the meter. He calls it Mike Demeter. And, and people will literally eat something an hour later. Does it raise my sugar? Now, this is not rocket science. We're keeping it simple. So rather, it's, it's not what Dr. Avadia says, Jack or Dr. Hampton, or even Dennis Pollack. It's what the meter says. So that's a great place to get foundational videos because this is a community. And I think we all have to kind of make sure people know what the resource. I remember that Christmas movie that made, I think it was the Macy's guy. The Santa Claus was sending people to other stores or something. <laughs> I think it was, the, my wife loves those Christmas uh, uh, movies. And, and so we're, I will send you to another store if it's going to help you heal. That's kind of, I think we all should do that. There's tons of people, 7% are metabolically healthy, right? So 93% of the country is saying we need help. And I don't care if we all start doing it, it wouldn't be enough. So we're going to, so we're going to share what we're all doing and help people heal. Thank Very you. Well said. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, Tony. This has been a great conversation and uh, just keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to try, man. I think you inspire me. I appreciate what you guys are doing together as a team. And uh, I will absolutely promise that I'll be doing that for sure. Well, I, I hope our paths cross in real life as well. I just want to shake your hand. I love your message and I love your vibe too. That I, I liked that thing you said about walking into a room and you can just tell by their vibe what oh, they're yeah. feeling. You and I, you're my Oh people. yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, Bill, guys. another good one, man. Thanks a lot. I love getting to, to I never run into people like this if it wasn't for this show with you, Phil, and I'm I'm really grateful. All right. Well, for Dr. Philip Ovedia, this has been the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. Our guest was Tony Hampton. Uh, all the show notes will have the links to all the various things that uh, Dr. Hampton has talked about. Go there. I don't know that I can say any more. Good stuff. We'll see you all next time. America is fat and sick and tired. 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy and at risk of a sudden heart attack. Are you one of them? Go to ifixhearts.co and take Dr. Ovedia's metabolic health quiz. Learn specific steps you can take to reclaim your health, reduce your risk of heart attack, and stay off Dr. Ovedia's operating table.